How's it going everybody? This is Beat the Bush. These are the EnjoyBot self-heating batteries. They have built-in heaters so that it'll heat up the cells if it's too cold to charge. It comes in various sizes. These are 12 volt, 100 amp hours each, and they're type group 4D, meaning that they comply to a certain standard size. Now, I actually don't really care about the batteries themselves. They're these giant heavy block things. They take up space, but I like what it can do for you because during the day, it can store solar energy and at night, it can discharge it back into your house. For these batteries, I'm gonna do your standard charge discharge test. Because it is a self-heating battery, I'll chill one of these and connect it to a charger and see what it does after I disassembled it. We can take a look at the heaters that's built in, do a tear down and check out everything that's inside. Check out the cell quality, check out the BMS quality. If you're looking to connect more than one batteries in series or parallel, most of the time, the battery manuals is gonna tell you to charge each of the batteries up individually up to 100%, connect them one at a time in parallel, wait 12 hours and wait for the voltages to equalize. This makes it so that they're all in sync. If it's slightly different in voltages and your charger assumes the entire battery is equalized, it might overcharge one of the batteries or over discharge one of them. Very important to keep them balanced and they also recommend you to take it all apart and charge them all up individually every six months or so. So if you don't actually wanna do that and you wanna connect them together, get a battery balancer. A shortcut that they don't mention is that when you buy the batteries, most of the time they've been stored in the same warehouse, they come together. And if you measure the battery voltages, it's within 0.01 volt of each other. If it's very, very close, you can actually connect them together right away. Use them in series, use them in parallel. That means you skip a step. You don't have to charge them each individually up to 100% first. So let's take a look at the voltages of each of these and see if we can connect them together without charging them up. This is a group 4D battery. This edge here to this other edge here is roughly 20 and a half inches long, 9.45 inches wide and about 8.6 inches tall. The battery weighs 44.8 pounds. This one is 13.18 and this one is 13.18. So even if I connect them in parallel, black to black, red to red, there's gonna be no current flow in between. They're already equalized. If I have a 24 volt system, I can connect them in series and they are already synced. You can charge these at up to 100 amps, but I'm gonna go at a maximum of a standard 20 amps. I have a lithium iron phosphate charger over here. I like to turn this thing on first to sort of pre-charge these terminals. You set it at a low current. For the best contact, you want to grab onto the largest portion of this terminal right there, and also with this one. This will give a little bit more pressure and more contact area, especially important if you're charging at a high current. So I'm gonna bump this up to 20 amps, which is around 280 watts. And then after it's full, we'll discharge it to see the usable capacity. They taped a bunch of fiberglass panels around it. This is pretty standard. And there's a bunch of fiberglass reinforced tape holding it together. This is a 2P4S configuration. Two of these 100 amp hour cells in parallel, minus to minus, plus to plus. This is one module. You have a second one over here, third, fourth. So four of these two packs in series. Take this out of the fiberglass case and we see the heaters on both sides of the battery pack on the long side. Both the plus and minus terminals have two six gauge 200C cables. Six gauge is pretty reasonable for 100 amps if it's a 200C cable, although it would get pretty hot. So you have two of them for 200 amps and you do have this heat resistance fiberglass to keep all the heat contained within this thing. Because this is four in series configuration, you have these battery balancing cables coming out to the positive minus and three more cables in between the battery cells. This is to monitor the cell voltage of each cell pack and balance it across these four cells. The two cells that are in parallel though, they're just considered one single pack. Bus bars are welded into place. Notice they're not using bolts here, which is good and bad depending on your perspective. If somehow you're going to replace a cell for some 
weird reason, then it will be very hard to work on this thing. But then again, most people are not going to replace a single cell or even notice that a single cell is broken. The heating pad is interesting because this is made out of like a silicone material. I've seen these used on a 3D printer before if you want to heat the heat bed, but I suppose you can do the same thing on the battery. Both heat pads are connected in parallel to this terminal right here, and they go out this way to each of the heat pads. On the other side of the heating element, it goes to this connector, and all of this goes to a cutoff sensor, and from there, it goes to the heating line of the controller. There's also both a PTC and an NTC temperature sensor. The PTC goes right here, and the NTC one goes over here. One of them is a negative temperature coefficient and another one is a positive temperature coefficient. Negative meaning that as the temperature goes up, the resistance goes down. Positive means as the temperature goes up, the resistance of this temperature sensor goes up. I like the redundancy over here just to cross check the temperature sensor information. The negative terminal of the battery is over here. You can think of the BMS as an intelligent switch between one terminal of the cells and the output terminal of the entire battery. So it goes from here to here. So if you disconnect this, the entire battery is cut off. This is how it can control the shutoff of the battery when there are any faults. Now there are a whole bunch of FETs in here. They are very highly in parallel to reduce the resistance. Because of the possible 200 amps that can flow from here to here, you want very little resistance in between, so it won't consume a lot of wattage passing that current. This is a 200 amp BMS. There's UART control, which isn't connected over here. There's also a switch control, but there is an antenna for Bluetooth monitoring. This bimetal temperature sensor goes to the main board. Both of these are temperature sensors that would open up at 60 degrees C. So that's around 140 degrees Fahrenheit. This one is wired in series with these heaters. So if it ever gets too hot, there's a physical device that will cut it off and stop the heating. So this prevents the controller from accidentally leaving the heater on and this temperature sensor will cut it off at 60 degrees C. There's a separate sensor here that will cut everything off at 60 degrees C as well. So this is kind of redundant to this bimetal sensor over here, but redundancy is welcome. Positive temperature coefficient model number BH05-BB5D 60C cuts off at 60C. Their website says these are grade A prismatic cells. The contacts and the build quality is in line with what I've seen with grade A cells. The BMS is held onto the side with some double-sided tape. This particular self-heating battery only self-heats if you are charging it. If this battery sits in very cold weather below zero degrees C, it's not gonna keep on warming itself until it completely drains. So we're gonna try charging this thing. And there's one single sensor to sense if it's freezing or not, and that's this bimetal one here. The heater itself uses three to six amps to heat itself. When you use the charger to charge it, you have to use more than that current in order to charge the battery. They recommend eight amps. I'm gonna turn on the charger and I'm gonna cool it here until the sensor reads something below zero degrees C. It's zero here, but on my charger, it's uh, six amps. And this six amps is actually not going into the battery, but rather into the heating pads on the side. All the little heating lines, the squiggly lines right there, it's heating the outside of the battery. On the other side is the same thing. Now to glue these guys back. I'm putting these temporarily until the glue cures just to hold them in place. Just so you guys know, whenever I do these charge tests, I don't actually waste the electricity. I dump them into another power bank. There's about 20% of conversion loss whenever it goes from one battery to another. Much better than burning it off in a heater, especially since it's summertime right now. I discharge this battery and I got a capacity of 220 12 amp hours. This is 106% of the rated capacity. I discharge it pretty hard all the way down to 10.2 volts. 10 volts being the absolute minimum it should ever reach. And I dumped the energy right back in and I got 208 amp hours. Now, why is there a slight difference here? Well, it really depends on the charger. My charger decided to stop at 14.6 volts. I have two power banks connected to this battery. I have all of this connected to a 3000 watt inverter. I'm gonna turn this on here and it's gonna start charging some of my battery banks. Ramps up to 160. I'm gonna step it up slowly, 195 amps. This battery can surge a little bit for a few seconds before it'll cut it off. So let's do 210, 208 amps. Let's see how long that runs for. 
right there. It certainly doesn't like being run over 200 amps, so it's a little bit sensitive in that sense. It ran about 5% over for around 20 seconds or so. So if you're gonna draw higher currents for longer than 10 seconds or so, it probably is not a good idea. Mostly the load should stay under 200 amps for this battery. Let me demonstrate the self-heating feature by putting this battery in the freezer. Put in the battery. I left it in here for 24 hours. Let's check out how cold it is. Feels like ice. The lid is 80. It's really warm in my garage, but inside it's three degrees Fahrenheit, minus 22 along the edges. So we did get it cold enough because it's only allowing me to charge at 6.6 .6 amps. The 6.6 .6 amps, it's going into the heater in order to warm the battery up. It took around 25 minutes to warm it up. Of course, it depends your ambient temperature if it's freezing outside still. Now it has jumped up to around 34 amps. There's a little bit of current limiting here. As it warms up further, it can probably charge even more. The battery gets a lot of damage done to it if it's really, really cold and you're charging it. However, if it's cold, it can still discharge just fine. That's why this battery tries to restrict the charging when it's too cold. You absolutely need a self-heating battery. You could stick the batteries in a warmer place, let it warm up by itself just from the ambient temperature. But having built-in heaters allows you to just connect the charger, allow it to heat it up from inside out. It makes it a lot more convenient for charging. If you guys are interested in these Enjoy Bot self-heating batteries, check out my affiliate link down in the video description below. Thanks for watching this video. Until next time.